So let's talk about USPCC playing cards. So playing cards are our tools, right? We're magicians, we're cardists, and so naturally, I mean, I guess we should get to know our tools because I mean, tools are basically nothing without their user. I mean, no matter your skill level, you still need to know your tools. And uh, even if you buy a more expensive deck of cards, it doesn't really help you all that much because again, uh, tools are nothing without the user. And so basically the user defines uh, sort of the utility or the skill level that the tool has. Uh, I really don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. So anyways, uh, yeah, I just thought that I should make a video about this just to familiarize ourselves with uh, the tools that uh, we have on hand, right? Cards, playing cards, right? But uh, so a lot of this knowledge that uh, is presented in this video, uh, originally I actually heard a lot about it uh, just from like, just from like interacting with people, right? Just from like uh, reading stuff about people, like t talking about like playing cards. And so it wasn't until recently, like <laughs> for making this video that, uh, yeah, I got more in depth into doing research. And so, yeah, that was a really interesting part of uh, making this video. And so, yeah, uh, I'm going to present some of my researches uh, and uh, findings and uh, whatnot. Uh, so, yeah. Now, just before we begin, I do have to say that I'm only going to be covering modern day USPCC playing cards. Uh, so from like 2023 onwards, uh, I, I know I know onwards because you know 2024 is coming soon. So yeah, but also uh, this is only for Kentucky playing cards. So nothing from Ohio. I might occasionally mention like Ohio stuff, like occasionally just for like history and whatnot. But generally, this should just be Kentucky like playing cards, right? Uh, I mean, a lot of things has changed over the past like decade so i mean like just from the kentucky factory uspcc gave up on the magic finish on the performance coding i mean a lot of things has changed and so that's why i'm just covering modern day uspcc play cards just for like like it's easier for me right now we'd like to go over a bit of history behind USPCC and how it came to be. So USPCC actually wasn't always the United States playing card company. It actually started out as a printing company. So like printing like magazines or whatever, right? I don't know what they printed, but they were a printing company. So that printing company was actually called Russell Morgan and Co Printing Company uh, and was founded back in 1867. Only It was only until 1881 that they actually made a branch that uh, specialized in playing cards. And so uh, that uh, the very first deck that they printed was actually the Tigers number 101 uh, playing cards. And so uh, that deck had some sort of like played design. But it wasn't until uh, 1885 where Bicycle Playing Cards, uh, the brand, was actually first established, which was actually really interesting. So the very first back design wasn't actually the Rider Backs. The Rider Backs came in 1887, so two years after uh, the Bicycle brand actually uh, started. The very first Bicycle back design, I'll show it over here, was actually the old fan backs. So that was the very first, like canonically, the very first uh, back design uh, created by Bicycle and printed out by Bicycle. So um, yeah, that's just a really interesting thing. But uh, if you want to learn more about like the long history of Bicycle playing cards and basically what they printed and uh, all the back designs that they had, uh, yeah, you should go ahead and visit bicycle bicyclecards.org. It's basically an independent website from uh, the the actual USPCC uh, website, but it details a lot about USPCC uh, playing card. Well, not USPCC specifically, but bicycle cards specifically. So everything from uh, yeah, from how to know what date they were from. Uh, just from back designs from when they first were started printing from when they were first uh, discontinued so there's just a whole bunch of history over there so i highly recommend you go visit bicyclecards.org now uh over time they actually acquired a bunch of companies right and those companies had their own proprietary 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 finishes and stocks and so as they started co collecting more of those companies they just like took those uh, sort of with them and so that's why a lot of um, 
USB-C decks have like so many different names for the same thing. I mean, over time, they sort of combined into the same thing, but beforehand, they were actually different. So for example, like Cambric, Linoid, Linen, those were all from different companies that they acquired and, you know, they sort of assimilated into them, right? But uh, over time, uh, yeah, USB-C would actually be bought out by a lot of different companies as well. So when Ohio, uh, Ohio actually changed from, uh, so when they changed from the Ohio company to the Kentucky factory, they they were actually owned by Newell. So Newell, uh, the company, I don't know what they actually do. So, you know, that's a, that's a thing. But yeah, so during a shift from Ohio to the Kentucky factory, uh, so that was in 2009. So a lot of playing cards produced uh, in the brand new Kentucky factory were actually really garbage. And so I actually have a couple of decks from that era and they do actually feel really disgusting. Like the, the edges are extremely rough. The cards were stiff for no reason. And so they just didn't handle the same. And so that rumor created, uh, and so that like history uh, about like three years worth of history basically led to the rumor that blue seals were superior to black seals. So black seals were the seals that were used in the Kentucky factory and blue seals were the uh, the seals for the uh, Ohio factory. And so that led to the rumor that blue seals were better than black seals. And that uh, rumor actually continued even today. And so, yeah, it's basically a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a long lasting history of, you know, blue seals are better than black seals because uh, of uh, of a three year long period where, uh, yeah, the Kentucky factory was just kind of garbage. I mean, it, they switched machines back then uh, when they moved from Ohio to Kentucky because apparently the Ohio machines were so worn out that they couldn't really like use them anymore. So that's why you switch machines. I assume like they weren't calibrated or anything. And so that's why it sucked. But yeah, so, uh, in 2019, Bicycle or USPCC playing cards, uh, wait, USPCC would be acquired by Cartamundi, which is the biggest like playing card producer in like the whole world. So you can see like some of their stuff, like they produce Magic the Gathering cards. Uh, I believe they produce Uno as well. And so they, uh, they actually dip their toes in like actual good usable playing cards for uh, magicians uh, with the B9 slimline uh, finish and whatnot, right? So there's actually, you know, they, uh, yeah. So they were acquired by Cartamundi in 2019. So a playing card is actually constructed of three layers or five if you count the glue layers, but I'll actually show it on my other camera. So as you can see from over here, a playing card has three layers. One is this thin layer over here. One is the center layer, which is actually thicker and darker. And one is the another slim layer. And in between of each of these layers, there is some glue layer. And so uh, for, for these uh, playing cards, uh, the thicker center actually helps the playing card become more opaque so you can't hold it up to the light and see uh, through it. The glue also helps that as well. But magicians actually split playing cards purpose on purpose to make gaff cards or gimmicks. I'm not going to tell you how to split it or I'm not, and I'm also not going to tell you why uh, they split it. I mean for what like gaff and gimmicks they split it for. But that is a thing that we use them for so yeah that's just uh the three layers of a well three or five layers of a playing card so there's actually two ways that you can actually print a deck of playing cards one is called sheet fed and the other is called web press so the way that sheet fed actually works is actually for a smaller print run so a small print run would be like a thousand to maybe like seven thousand five hundred or something along those lines right i'm not exactly sure but a sheet fed essentially works in that you have this sheet of playing cards so like a like sheet of cardboard so if you see like an uncut sheet of a uh, of a playing card that's essentially a product of a sheet fed uh, before it gets cut up and so a sheet fed works in that you have a sheet of playing cards you feed it into a printer where it gets printed uh, on both sides I believe and then yeah it gets cut up into uh, individual strips and then it gets punched out uh, individually, right? So that's how a sheet fed works. A web press is a uh, basically this massive machine that doesn't involve uh, 
you know, individual, she individual sheets, right? Rather, it's the entire roll that gets put into the machine, printed on both sides, and then cut up into sheets. So that's the main difference. And a web press actually is for runs of 10,000 or more. So if, if you're a magician or a cardist and you want to print a deck of playing cards on, uh, on the web press, then you need to have a uh, custom order of 10,000 or more uh, to use the web press. So it's, it's gonna be expensive, but apparently it's more consistent and the borders are more like uh, aligned. But you know, I, I've, uh, I don't really know uh, much about that claim. Uh, generally, I guess it should be more consistent because it's the same roll of paper, but you know, I don't really know. But yeah, essentially after uh, the decks get like printed, then you have like, uh, they get again cut up into sheets and then they get cut into strips. And then for those strips, they get punched out each uh, individual card. So that's how a web press works. The cutting process is generally the same uh, as a sheet fed, it's just like, the, the machine is different, it's way bigger. And also like there's a, yeah, the stock is handled differently. So moisture actually plays a huge role in how a deck will uh, will uh, be, right? It, it will play a huge role in the state of its deck, uh, of its lifespan or whatever you want to call it, right? So moisture is basically what causes deck clicks. If you don't know what deck click is, it's basically this annoying thing that happens to playing cards where they just sort of bend together. And so every time you try to straighten them out, they make this clicking noise. So. Uh, I don't really have a deck that has a click uh, that has a click right now, but I'll try to imitate the noise. So it basically has this noise, right? And basically has this noise for like a long time. And when you try to unbend it, sometimes the packets go in opposite directions and you can actually spin them one on top of another. So it is really obnoxious. And the reason why deck click happens is because of moisture. Right, and so moisture tends to change in the atmosphere because of maybe like temperature changes, or maybe if you're on an airplane or something, altitude. Altitude can also play a role in moisture differences, right? And so when moisture is, uh, there's too much moisture or when there's not enough moisture, playing cards or paper will try to return to its original state. And the original state of playing cards is uh, in a roll, right? <laughs> so, that's why uh, they do tend to try and bend uh, when there's too much or too little moisture. Generally, uh, there's there's not really like a way to control deck clicks. You can try to uh, play with moisture in your room maybe. So if you have like a humidifier or a dehumidifier, then maybe you could try and play with the moisture content and see uh, what keeps your decks uh, away from clicks, right? On an airplane, I mean, some people say that like if you have a uh, deck clip, right? Something like, uh, like this is like a, an aluminum one. If you have something like that, it'll keep the deck straight, but I'm not so sure about that, but you know, to each their own, right? So there's actually four, uh, well, there's technically two different stocks of playing cards, but you have four options when it comes to printing deck of, uh, decks of playing cards. So the very first one is a retail stock. So something like this, it's uh, basically the stock that's uh, bicycle is printed on. So we also call it bicycle stock or bike stock. Then we have something known as the casino stock, the premium stock or B, the B stock. It's something that's thicker and it is uh, meant to last longer. So it is thicker because it's meant to, you know, last for more gameplay and you know, it's meant for casino. So more meant for excessive use. And I'll put in an image that will uh, sort of compare the two uh, bicycle and uh, B stock together, right? And you'll see like how much thicker it is. It's about two cards thicker, so that's that. But uh, besides these two stock, there is also an option to crush the stocks. And uh, the process of crushing stocks is essentially as you apply uh, the finish on the playing cards, you're actually tightening up the, the, the rolls that actually apply the finish so closer together and as the as the stock goes closer uh well it goes in between of those rollers it's actually getting like an extra like maybe uh like i don't know how much thinner but they're actually getting crushed a bit more and that leads to crush stock and so the cards aren't necessarily like thinner they're just more like compact if that sort of makes sense and so uh yeah i'll just put more images up so for example the uh chair casino uh, which is a crushed b stock versus a normal b stock 
And we have something like the N1 Worldwide Playing Cards, which is a crushed bike stock versus a normal bike stock. And then I'll do some more comparisons on the screen right now. And so one really interesting thing about the uh, crush stock is that originally uh, there was no such thing as a crush stock. It wasn't until 2014 where Guy Hollingworth collaborated with Dan Dave to create his own deck of playing cards that crush stock existed. And so uh, USPCC actually forced Dan and Dave to sign a waiver that said like, oh, if the, our machines broke or anything, then you know, you would, they would need to pay uh, reparations. Uh, rep Rep reparations, I, I think that's how you pronounce it. But yeah, so basically this was a process that no one really like did beforehand. Uh, and so everything deck beforehand was just probably a product of the paper stock and not necessarily of the process of uh, this, uh, the rolls crushing it together. And so Guy Hollingworth was uh, the very first like deck of playing cards to have uh, this crushed stock. And so it wasn't until 2016 that Crush Stock was actually made public. And so yeah, since then, I mean, so many cardistry companies and magic companies have decided to use a Crush Stock, which is actually really interesting. I mean, beforehand, if you want to print a deck on the Crush Stock, the minimum amount of orders would be 1,500. But uh, I think recently, like one or two years uh, ago, they actually made the minimum order 2,500. So they upped that. It's probably because of inflation or something. I don't know. But one really interesting thing about stocks is that they're actually not like a given like stock, right? They're actually, uh, the stocks are actually uh, named, uh, they're actually given the title of B or uh, bike stock based on how thick they are. And this thickness is actually a margin. So it's a range from this thickness to this thickness. And B stock is also a thickness from this thickness to this thickness. And so if a stock fits within that margin, then it is a B stock. If it fits within that margin, then it is a bike stock. So that's how uh, stocks are classified, right? It's basically which margin they fit into. So ink actually plays a huge role into how a deck feels. <laughs> yeah, surprise, I guess. So uh, usually uh, as a rule of thumb, sort of, the more ink that a deck of playing card has on the face or the back, the more clumpy that they feel. The less ink that they have, the less clumpy that they feel. Obviously, again, this is just like a rule of thumb. It doesn't have to be like every deck of playing cards. But generally, uh, if, uh, if for example, like I had like, I had like, uh, I had decks that had like every like inch of it printed with ink and those felt so bad. Like those were so clumpy, it was kind of gross. But yeah, so that's just like a general rule of thumb. And so it's something that you should probably take notice of and do research before you buy uh, the deck, right? Another thing is that Pantone inks, right? So something that's not CMYK inks is that they actually uh, feel different, right? So according to my friends, I don't really have this deck, but according to my friends, the dot playing cards by N1 Worldwide are printed on Pantone inks, and that's why they actually feel um, a lot better or different compared to the normal CMYK playing cards. So uh, can I confirm that? Not really, but you know, uh, a lot of people in the card industry com community just say like, oh, dot playing cards, they feel really good and they're printed on Pantone. So there has to be some basis behind that. Now, there's also a third option of ink called metallic inks. And this option of ink is basically a slight shine when it comes to, uh, comes to a, uh, a ink, right? So here over on my cherry casino, as you can see that the red is actually slightly metallic. Maybe it doesn't show as well across on camera, but there is that option. Uh, there is that like shine sort of thing. Uh, for me, I can't really tell how much uh, it plays a role into how it feels. For me, Cherry Casinos feel sort of normal, but there isn't really a lot of metallic ink on it. I mean, there's just these two, so I can't really say how much uh, metallic ink plays a role into how it feels. But uh, something like the Peelers V4, um, there is a lot of metallic ink on that, so you can go ahead and check that out. But generally, uh, yeah, those are the three ink options that you have for uh, USPCC. So CMYK, Pantone, and sort of metallic ink. 
So foil, foil, <laughs> again, surprise, plays a huge role into how a deck of playing cards will feel. Uh, so foil will actually cause the cards to be a bit more sticky uh, at the beginning, right? Uh, I know that uh, as you start to use them, they actually start to clump up a lot more compared to like normal playing cards. And so there's actually two processes uh, for foil, for how to apl apply foil onto playing cards. One is called hot stamping, so hot, hot foil or uh, cold foil, right? So hot stamping, I'll start hot stamping first, is uh, when uh, you have basically this, uh, well, uh, it's when you basically have this like foil and you have this heated brass that just applies the foil, it presses down the foil. So you have like the foil, you have the card and then you have the brass, you just apply it onto the card, right? And so you have, you print it, uh, you print the card out first and then you apply the foil. This process of foil actually causes some elevation differences on the playing cards. So I, I'm not sure if I can get across camera, but if you can actually see on this playing card is that this actually causes debossing into uh, the playing card. So I can actually feel uh, wherever there is foil, it actually sinks in a bit. So that is a disadvantage of hot foil. Another disadvantage is that if you actually look closely, if, uh, if I actually bend the card a bit here, you can actually see the foil on the other side of the playing cards, even though there is not foil. So again, there's two disadvantages for hot foil is that, uh, again, there's a sort of debossing when it comes to foil, and you can also see it through the playing card. So that is a disadvantage. Uh, another, the other process, right, which is cold foil, is that it actually does require a bit of heat, but less as well. And so it is basically, uh, you apply the piece of foil first, and then you print the rest of the playing card on top. And so if you look at uh, this, this deck, which uses cold foil, you can see that there's actually not any like textural difference. This is completely flush against the deck of playing cards and also doesn't appear on the other side of the card, right? So that is a difference between the two uh, types of foils. So uh, cold foil, to, in my experience, apparently is more uh, is more precise. So sometimes if you look at hot foil playing cards, they're a bit off to the side or maybe like they're not exact with the design. And so you can see that sort of with uh, the regalias, so this deck. So you can sort of see that sometimes with the uh, with these cards as well. Um, also, uh, I just want to say both foil decks were actually from Cardamundi. I don't have any foil cards from uh, USBCC. Well, I do, but I don't have a cold foil deck from USBCC. So I sort of needed to use Cardamundi as a comparison. So those two were Cardamundi, but USBCC playing cards, as far as I know, also have the same problems. So it's not just a Cardamundi problem. So finish, finish, again, that uh, plays a huge role into how playing cards feel, surprise, I know. <laughs> but finish refers to more of a texture than more of a coating, right? So uh, USPCC actually doesn't use coatings for their playing cards. They used to for maybe like their magic finish or maybe their performance coating, but not anymore. Some of their brands, like for example, Fournier, which is printed in Spain, still use a coating. But again, USPCC itself does not use uh, coatings anymore. So there's two finishes. One is air cushion and then the other is smooth. Air cushion can be a lot of things. It can be called a lot of things rather. It can be called linoid, linen, cambric, and uh, the whole line, whole line, the whole nine yards, right? Everything basically. But the main reason why again they're called that is because they acquired so many companies and uh, they just sort of took their names right but nowadays everything is basically the same it's basically only air cushion or smooth and so if you look at a air cushion finish for example you can actually see that the cards are uh, they have this nice little bump over here right they have bumps over them right and so these bumps are applied to the playing card via a uh, a roller, 
and this roller has a bunch of little bumps and as the playing card is actually passed through this roller these bumps this will roll the texture onto the playing cards right and so this will give uh, the decks the uh, the little bumps and these bumps actually allow air to travel in between and that's uh, that's why it's called air cushion finish right it's because there's legitimately air that pro that helps uh, reduce friction and so yeah, uh, one little fun fact is that linen and linoid and whatever, beforehand they actually used fabric, right? They actually used linen. They wrapped the linen around those rollers. And so when you actually put the piece of uh, cardstock oh, uh, uh, like in between of those linen rollers, they would actually apply the linen texture over the playing cards. And that's why it's called a linen finish. So the very next uh, texture or uh, finish is called a smooth finish. And so, uh, yeah, as the name implies, there's basically nothing on the playing card. So if you look at my camera over here, you can see that there is no texture whatsoever. It is, again, it is completely smooth. I mean, there is there is some sort of interesting texture, uh, but again, it's not really, it doesn't really contribute anything. It's again, it's, uh, it's just smooth. Uh, these cards might actually feel a bit more plasticky than you're used to. They're not plastic, they're actually paper, but uh, if you just touch them, you're gonna be like, oh, that's very uh, glossy, that's very plasticky. But also don't worry, they just, they handle the same as normal, uh, as normal air cushion uh, finish playing cards, right? So uh, one fun fact about uh, air cushion finish uh, playing cards or linen playing cards is that they actually sucked. Like back then, they actually sucked. They sucked so badly. Like I own cards from like the 1960 or 1940 era, and they were they actually handle horribly. And so I believe that's the main reason why Ernest actually writes only about uh, false deals with get readies. So uh, for example, like a push off second deal, or maybe a uh, a push off. Uh, a push off uh, sort of a uh, bottom deal. So he only writes about those because strike uh, strike false deals were not viable back then. If you did a strike deal with a sort of uh, with a card with so much friction, chances are you'll get a hanging card. And if you do like a hanging card, for example, if you like finish dealing one card, this card will also come along and people will be able to tell that you did a false deal. So again, that uh, that finish was just not viable for back then so they just did get readies uh, to compensate for the fact that the finish was horrible so yeah that's just a fun fact and so uh, you should take notice that not every deck of vintage playing cards will feel the same as modern day playing cards that's just how much technology has advanced and uh, yeah just how crap uh, the, the playing cards back then were so yeah so there's two types of cuts when it comes to playing cards. One is called a modern cut and the other is called a traditional cut. So the main difference is how, uh, whether the sheet of playing cards is face up or face down. So if it's face up, then and the blade will go this way, right? So notice how the blade is actually going at a sort of slight angle, right? So if it's face up, then it goes like that. It's sort of the same process. It just depends on where the sheet is face up or face down. So uh, whether or not the sheet is face up or face down actually plays a role into how it's cut. So a modern cut, for example, is when a sheet is actually uh, cut face up, I believe. And so if you have a modern deck of playing cards, then the Pharaoh shuffle will uh, will be a uh, top to bottom share of Pharaoh, right? So I'm going from a top to the bottom, right? Sort of Pharaoh, right? Now, if I, if I had a traditional cut, for example, it would be the opposite. It would be a bottom to top, right? So I'm going from the bottom few cards to the top, like so. So that's the main difference between a traditional and a modern cut. Generally, there's not really a difference if uh, you're just like an everyday card user, but for magicians or for cardists, then the cut of the playing cards does play a role in how, uh, how the cards are. So uh, traditional, uh, right, so an easy hack to actually tell whether a deck is traditional or a modern cut it's just to look at the retail listing. I mean, that's the easiest way because a traditional, 
A traditional cut will be listed as a feature for most playing card companies. They're gonna market it as, yeah, look, this deck is a traditional cut. Yeah, you should definitely buy it. It's for the workers. And so the reason why traditional cut is a feature is because, again, it's good for maybe like card handlers, but it's also because traditional cut, I believe, is an extra charge. So they have to manually flip the sheet over to be cut up uh, uh, for it to have like a traditional cut. So that's a additional cost and that's why companies also list it as a additional feature. So uh, if you know how to, uh, another easy hack is that if you know how to pharaoh a deck of playing cards, you just need to have, uh, for example, if you have this deck, you just really need to split the deck in half and just lightly rub the deck in both directions. And depending on which way the deck pharaohs easier, so I can tell this is a traditional deck. If I try to do a modern deck, you can tell that it is slightly, um, it is slight, actually maybe I, should, no, I shouldn't do it with that. that. That one's so used that both can work. But if I had a bicycle deck, for example, if I tried a more, uh, a traditional Pharaoh, it worked. But if I tried a modern Pharaoh, this won't work because you can see like, if I, no matter how much I try to wedge it in, the cards won't weave together. So that is an easy way to tell whether or not a deck is traditional cut or a modern cut. So yeah. So for seals, seals, not like the animal. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> so there's basically three types of uh, options when you have for seals. Seals, you have the standard black seal. So the Kentucky uh, black seal uh, over here, actually, like so. Or you can have no seal at all, which is, you know, no seal, <laughs> no seal. So basically something like this, right? You have no seal on your deck of playing cards. Or again, you can have a uh, company or you can outsource it or you can ask USBCC to make a custom seal like so, right? So there are three options, standard, the standard black seal, the, uh, the no seal, or you can have a custom seal, which is comes at, it, uh, at an additional cost. But back then we had more seal options. So if you have a deck uh, that you can see that has a blue seal, so this deck has a blue seal, this means that the deck was most likely printed in Ohio back in um, back before 2009. If you have a deck with a red seal, like so, then the deck was probably also printed in Ohio, but, uh, but this was meant for more like uh, casinos or it had like higher quality control. So that's the main difference. But you do have to do some further research into uh, custom decks nowadays because custom decks nowadays, they do have uh, maybe occasionally blue or red seals. So do some research into the uh, printing date of the deck that you want to buy and whether or not there is like a new printing or not. Because I know like, for example, the Arco playing cards, uh, I mean, some people, uh, some of the newer printings have like a blue or a red seal just for like customization options, but the ones before that didn't really have that. So do your own research and don't be fooled by uh, by the seal alone. So make sure that you know, you're know you buying something from that era, right, specifically. So tuck cases, there's two tuck cases that you can get. You can get this uh, cardboard <laughs> tuck case as per usual, uh, like for bicycle playing cards, or you can get a mat tuck, something like this, which is basically a very nice paper texture like so. And so for this tuck case, you actually have to outsource it. I believe Bicycle or USPCC playing cards actually has a deal with uh, Clove Street Press. So whenever you want to print something with a mat tuck, they actually outsource it to Clove Street Press. And so having a mat tuck not only allows you to have like that nice little texture, but it also adds a lot more uh, customization options for your tuck case. So for example, you can have like debossing, embossing, foil, and just like a whole bunch of more customization options versus if you just had like your plain like cardboard box, right? This boring thing. Uh, but what's really interesting is that the cellophane is also different. So if you actually notice like uh, your Matt Tuck uh, cellophane, there's no like pull tab on it. It sucks, right? You're, like you really can't open it. But with the USPCC like proper playing card uh, tuck cases for the cellophane, you can actually, there's actually like a nice pull tab around it that you can actually like rip open and whatnot, right? Clove Street Press's cellophane 
like is genuine garbage. So it is, uh, you might need a knife to open closed street press uh, cut cases. But other than that, for USPCC plank guards, their pull tab actually works, which is surprising to some degree. So yeah, do take notice of that. But that's about it. Man, that was a long video. <laughs> I mean, it, it was very long. But if you're curious about uh, plank cards or you want to read about them in sort of more detail, uh, you can go ahead and look at the plank card decks uh, blog. They're, uh, I believe, a person by the name of Ender's Game Reviews actually writes uh, the the articles over there and there is a lot of stuff uh, over there that he does do uh, that they do proper research on so you can go ahead and check out their work um, occasionally I did need to consult that uh, to make sure that I had all my facts right so shout out to them and you can also visit Slim Magic's uh, Tumblr blog. Uh, there he writes about like uh, the uh, the old seal, so blue seals and red seals and whatnot. And so yeah, feel free to visit them as well. And go go visit uh, Slim Card Co's uh, the. Uh the magic shop uh well they're they're not their magic shop but also their uh their gaff card shop there they sell like custom stripper decks custom uh yeah all sorts of casino gaff cards which is very cool and so yeah they're all hand created so you know if you want like a custom uh stripper deck then you know you can go ahead and visit slimcardco.com if you want to read more about the playing card decks uh blog then just go like to playingcarddecks.com and uh, yeah, you can go ahead and pick up a deck or or two over there. So yeah, generally, uh, yeah, long video, but you know, it's pretty fun. I mean, uh, I like uh, doing research and uh, having the opportunity to look into playing cards once more is uh, a genuinely very fun. But I just, uh, I mean, looking into this, uh, this for this video was actually very interesting because you could actually see sort of the progression of playing cards throughout not even this like not even like in the last 50 years but in just like 10 years like it has advanced so much it's actually really fascinating i mean uh like legends playing card company they started printing on pure black cardstock so rather than printing like an entire layer of black on top of a white cardstock they just had black cardstock and then they printed on top of it so genuine genuinely it is very interesting and i just can't wait to see what the uh playing card inter industry has to offer in uh in the future but besides that uh yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video uh i know it's a it was very tiring for me to make it but it was also a lot of fun so uh yeah see you guys next time stay safe stay healthy and uh yeah see you guys next time